As they're heading down, we are going to turn to God's word. This morning, we're going to read some of Jesus' parables, particularly some of those found in Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13, we'll be reading verses 24 to 46. Before we read these words together, let's again come to God in prayer. Lord God, help us to know your ways. Teach us your paths. Lead us in your truth and teach us, for you are the God of our salvation. For you we wait all day long. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Matthew 13, starting at verse 24. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that, at that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat, the wheat and bring it into my barn. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all your seeds, yet when it grows, it, become, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all through the dough. Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. So was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. <clears throat> he answered, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world and the good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Brothers and sisters in Christ, have you ever had it that you were pretty sure, fairly certain you understood how, how something is supposed to work? And you assume, you know, this, this thing is a fairly basic concept that should be universal. Almost anyone, wherever you went, would understand it. But then then you end up someplace different, maybe a different country, different part of the same country, and you realize, you know, they've got the same general idea, but there are still some small and significant differences. My family had that coming back from the U.S. to Canada. For instance, as many of you I'm sure have realized, they've got restaurants in the U.S., lots of them, all kinds. And for the most part, a restaurant in the U.S. works pretty much the same as a restaurant in Canada, except that, for instance, the first time we took our kids out, a formal restaurant, waiters, waitresses, menus, and all that, 
we realized our kids were assuming, oh, they, they've got refills, free refills for your soft drinks. A lot of US restaurants do that. A lot of Canadian restaurants do not. It's a small thing, but especially when they're charging, what, like three, five bucks for a soft drink? It's good to remember that. <laughs> Now, the reason I'm sharing that with you, that story, it's because you get kind of the same sort of thing happening with many of the key concepts, with many of the key words that come up in the Bible. You get concepts in the Bible like kingdom, especially the, the, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. And those concepts are very similar, actually, to things we experience in life, in this world. But the way they work in the Bible isn't always the same as, as how they work in everyday life. And we're told in the Gospels that the kingdom, the coming of the kingdom, that was a very central theme in Jesus' own ministry, in his preaching. In Matthew, that idea that the kingdom is near comes up very close to the beginning of his gospel. Already in Matthew chapter 3, it's introduced through John the Baptist. And when Jesus then begins his own public ministry after John is arrested, Jesus takes up that theme. He also starts preaching, repent because the kingdom is near. The kingdom is at hand. There's one thing we should sort out before we keep going. In Matthew, he talks about Jesus preaching the kingdom of heaven. But when, when you read some of the other gospels, especially Mark and Luke, you get the kingdom of heaven not the kingdom of God. And you might wonder why, why the difference? Why does one talk about the kingdom of God and the other the kingdom of heaven? And, and really, there is no difference. Matthew uses the term kingdom of heaven more often, but that seems it's mostly because he was originally writing his gospel for Jewish readers, for people who had been raised as Jews but become followers of Christ. But many Jews had become so concerned about misusing God's name that they tried to avoid using it at all if they could. And so instead of calling it the kingdom of God, Matthew uses the term kingdom of heaven. But essentially, both terms point to the same thing, the same idea that the God who lives and rules over all things from his throne on heaven, he is a king. And as a king, he has a kingdom. Now, getting back then to, to Jesus and how he then started preaching about the kingdom. Most of his listeners at the time, they probably would have perked right up as soon as they heard that, that the kingdom is at hand, the kingdom is near. Because they, all, they all would have known what a kingdom was. They lived at a time in a world where there were kings of all kinds and then emperors who really, in fact, were kings. And they understood the basic concept that a kingdom is a territory. It's a space where one person is in charge. They have the final authority. What they say goes. But then Jesus' listeners, a lot of them, they were also longing for a day when they would again have a king and kingdom of their own. They were under the rule of people like Herod and, and the emperors from Rome. They longed for another king of their own, a king like David, a king who would take on their enemies, a king who would liberate them, deliver them from foreign rulers who were oppressing them. And they longed then for the fulfillment of all those Old Testament promises about how there would be an anointed one, a Messiah who would come to rescue them. They understood those promises mainly in terms of a coming king, a king who would again establish a kingdom on earth, an earthly kingdom. And so like I said, when Jesus started talking about the kingdom is coming, this kingdom is near, their ears would have perked up. They would have been paying attention. But the trouble was that as Jesus continued his ministry, as he continued preaching about the coming of this kingdom, it became more and more clear to people Jesus was talking about a very different kind of kingdom than the one they had in mind. And that, that comes out especially in that chapter we just read a portion of from Matthew 13. Jesus, Jesus tells his listeners this series of stories, parables, and almost every one of them begins with, the kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom is like, like this, like that. And most of Jesus' listeners, they probably were hoping that Jesus would have said things like, like the kingdom of heaven, it's, it's, like, it's like a lion. 
It's like a lion. It's powerful. It's proud. It's majestic and fierce. Or the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven is like a mighty army, an army that sweeps away all its opposition. I would have loved it if Jesus had said something like, the kingdom is like a fortress, impregnable, imposing, inspiring awe in everyone who looks at it. But instead, instead of saying stuff like that, what Jesus says instead, it's, it's all very ordinary. It's even kind of oddball, these, these stories about like, the kingdom is like a farmer. The kingdom's like a farmer who went and sowed seed, good seed, but then he discovers an enemy has come and sown weeds in his field. And I'm sure a lot of people would have heard that and wondered, wait a minute, you're saying the kingdom is one apparently that, that can't stop its enemies from sneaking in and doing damage, from doing mischief. That's what the kingdom is like. The kingdom of heaven is not going to be able to overcome its enemies and wipe out its opponents. Is that what Jesus is telling us? Or Jesus says to them, you know, the kingdom of heaven is like a tiny seed. It's like a little bit of yeast or leaven that you would use when you're baking. And I'm sure a lot of people said, okay, but what good is that? What good is a kingdom so small you can barely see it? What good is a kingdom that seems so insignificant that hardly anyone is aware that it's there. Or Jesus says the kingdom of heaven, it's like a treasure hidden in a field. It's like a pearl waiting to be found. Okay, well, at least then he's saying the kingdom is valuable, it's precious. But is Jesus also saying there's a chance we might miss it? Are people going to accidentally overlook the kingdom? Plus, it might have bothered people too how Jesus seems to be saying that, that folks need to be willing to give up all they've got just to get into this kingdom. This kingdom calls for sacrifice. Most people, I'm sure, were thinking, no, 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 Jesus, you don't understand. We thought the kingdom was going to do something for us. But you're saying we've got to go all out for the kingdom? We've got to give up everything for it? How does that make sense? Now, most of us listening to these parables some 2,000 years later, we realize there is more to what Jesus is saying. We recognize that the kingdom Jesus is talking about, it is not of this world to to paraphrase an old car commercial, he's talking about a different kind of kingdom, different kind of king. The problem is still, the problem is that it's still possible for us to also get the kingdom wrong, the way Jesus' listeners did at first. For example, there, there is this tendency to assume, well, if Jesus' kingdom is not of this world, it's the kingdom of heaven after all, well, then that must mean this kingdom is entirely otherworldly. And so people assume, well, you get to the kingdom only when you die, when your disembodied soul goes up to heaven after you pass away. That's when you get to the kingdom. And I suspect part of the reason we, we think that way about the kingdom, it has to do with how we have parables explained to us. I remember as a little kid, people told me basically, well, parables are stories about heaven. A parable is a earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Looking at that, that's not really what parables are. Jesus' parables, they're, they're meant to be pictures. They're meant to be illustrations of how his kingdom has, in fact, entered into this world. His kingdom is at work in this world, even as we speak. It's not just out there in the future. The fact that Jesus describes the kingdom in such ordinary and everyday ways, that affirms how the kingdom is not just an otherworldly reality. It's, it's not something far removed from our everyday life. Yes, the kingdom Jesus talks about is from heaven. The kingdom has God as its center, its source, its origin. It's God's kingdom. But if God has a kingdom, if God really is king, he's our king, 
That means we need to acknowledge his kingship already now. We need to recognize that he is king in real and concrete ways as we live out our lives in this world right now. We need to live in a way that shows he is, in fact, our king. You also get people who assume when Jesus talks about the kingdom, what he's really talking about is, is the idea of the millennium a thousand year reign. And that comes up, especially in passages like Revelation chapter 20. That's where Jesus is, according to what John tells us, the apostle John, Jesus returns and he judges the living and the dead. And at that time, there will be a thousand year reign on earth. And people assume that this thousand year reign, this millennium will be a time of peace, of prosperity. This will be then when the kingdom comes. It sounds good, but the problem is with, with reading Revelation 20 that way, you ignore what Jesus himself says in other places. Jesus does say the kingdom is coming. The kingdom is at hand. It's near. But you also get passages where he says very clearly the kingdom is here. The kingdom has come upon us. Even when Jesus says my kingdom is not of this world, he's talking with Pilate. He's being judged, but he also doesn't deny it when Pilate says, so you are a king. Jesus is willing to be acknowledged as a real king. And so even though, even though we may not see or experience the power of Jesus' kingdom in all its fullness, in all its splendor and, and might, we live in a world still where Jesus' authority as king is challenged. His rule is still actively resisted. But his kingdom is still here. His kingdom is still real. And as king, Jesus calls for, he commands our allegiance. He calls for our love and loyalty, not just later, but now. And so we need, we need then to be careful not to assume that the kingdom is something coming in the distant future or that it's up above in another realm. But we also, we also need to be careful not to, to get our ideas from, about the kingdom totally from the past either. And that is something some Christians do, do tend to do as well. They have this tendency to go back to the past, back to the stories about the Old Testament kingdom of Israel under David and his descendants and they assume, well, the coming of God's people must mean that God's people, the church, we are still called then to establish a kingdom like that, an earthly kingdom here and now. And they even assume, well, the church then must be called to seize the reins of power and establish what they call a theocracy. Kingdom run by God, basically. And if force is needed to do that, then so be it. you run up against the fact that Jesus himself, great David's greater son, he rarely, rarely used force to assert the claims of his kingdom. Not that Jesus never did anything that we might even distantly describe as violent. You think of when he chased the money changers and merchants out of the temple. You think of the words he used against the Pharisees and Sadducees, and the fact that we have that story where Jesus is yelling at a tree. But someone pointed out to me recently, you also notice when Jesus uses force, when he gets rough, it isn't against anyone outside what we would consider the church either. He doesn't go after people out there. He goes after the ones, the religious folks that should know better. And Jesus does not, does not command his followers to try and take hold of the levers of power either. And that, that doesn't mean Christians should not get involved in politics. If God is king and he claims this world as his kingdom for his kingdom, every part of it, that includes then government, includes the political process, that too is under God's rule. But we need to remember for starters that, that when you look back at that Old Testament theocracy that Israel had, it didn't work. Not the way it was supposed to, and it didn't last. 
It was there in its time for a reason, for a purpose. And a lot of that was to show God's people, this is not the way. This is not how I am undoing what sin has done. And even though God did call his Old Testament people to, to establish that kingdom on earth, that's not what we get from Jesus in his parables. According to what Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like a farmer who sowed good seed in his field only to discover that an enemy had come and sown weeds, and not just any weeds, but noxious weeds, poisonous ones. But the farmer doesn't just give up. The farmer doesn't just throw up his hands, sure, yeah, you want to pull up all the, all the stuff, go for it, pull up the good and the bad. Instead, instead, he waits. He allows the weeds to grow so that he can save the wheat. He lets the weeds come up so that he can still have the wheat, so that he can, when the time comes, there will be a crop, there will be a harvest. And so what Jesus gives us is a picture of how his kingdom is here. His kingdom is real. It is, in fact, at work in this world. But it's not the only kingdom in this world. There is another, another kingdom opposed to his. There is an enemy out there that seeks to disrupt, to destroy what he can. But then this parable also makes clear the enemy, the enemy does not get his way. The enemy doesn't get the farmer to give up. This farmer, he's willing to wait. He's willing to play the long game. He makes it clear the enemy has not gotten the better of him. And so this parable illustrates how we see two kingdoms at work in this fallen world, two kingdoms competing, both seeking to try and occupy the same space. But these kingdoms aren't the same. They are not equal. As the one hymn says, though the wrong seems off so strong, God is the ruler yet. And according, according to what Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. It's tiny. It's itty bitty. But given time, it will grow. It will grow into this spreading tree. He says the kingdom is like a bit of yeast, a bit of leaven. Again, it's small, it's tiny, but it's able to permeate and then transform an entire huge batch of dough. And again, what Jesus gives us then is a picture, a picture of how his kingdom is at work in this world, but it often comes in ways we would never expect. The kingdom often doesn't look like much, yet it is there. It's growing, expanding its sphere of influence until one day it will fill and change everything, both individual hearts and this entire world. According to what Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man finds buried in a field, and he right away decides to sell everything he has so that he can buy that field and, and claim that treasure as his own. Jesus says the kingdom is like a pearl, a pearl of such beauty, such perfection, that a merchant would be willing to sell everything he has just so that he can have that pearl. What Jesus says, it, it gives us a picture of how, yes, in a sense, the kingdom does have to be found. It isn't always obvious. And lots of people do pass by without noticing it, without realizing the kingdom's infinite value. But what Jesus is also saying is that it is still possible to find this kingdom and it's still possible to have it already now. And for those that do find it, for those that persist, it is worth the cost. This kingdom, it's not yet here in all its fullness. It's not here yet in all its glory. And that's why a lot of people, it just doesn't make sense what we do. You know, why give up so much when it seems like you're getting so little? 
But in the end, this kingdom is worth it. It's worth the cost of discipleship. It is worth the cost of following Jesus. In a way, what Jesus teaches us about the kingdom, it, it pulls together all these other holy words that we've been looking at as well, that if, if God is king, if he's Lord, he's worthy of our worship. All things were created for him. All things point in his direction. Everything in creation directs us to him. And if God is king, if he has a kingdom, it should be obvious who his subjects are, the citizens of his kingdom. They should, they should resemble him. They should be holy, set apart. They should be different because they belong to him. They belong to a different kingdom. But then this also helps us see this idea of the kingdom, what sin really is. Sin really is, in a sense, rebellion, a rebellion that has arisen within God's kingdom. There's this power, this influence trying to claim the kingdom for itself. It seeks to rob the true king of the glory and honor that, that is rightfully his by taking what he made and twisting it. And that's why the Bible also talks about the world the way it does, at times as if it were good, at other times as if it were evil. Because on the one hand, as we saw, the world still is a good creation of God, but it has also come under the influence of the evil one. And so from a kingdom perspective, the world really is the battleground between these two competing kingdoms. But then it also affects the way we think about the word save. Because these two kingdoms, they're not the same. They're not equal. God's response to sin, his answer to this rebellion that has been raised up against him, his answer is that he does not abandon what he has made. He saves. He saves. With the coming of Jesus, with his death and resurrection, that decisive victory against sin has been won. With Christ, the kingdom has come, often it seems in small ways, like a small beachhead in enemy-occupied territory. The kingdom has come and is coming. Full liberation, full deliverance of all that God has made is on its way. And so, in the meantime, what do we do with all this as as God's people as his church living in this fallen world. What do we do with this idea of the kingdom? Well, one thing we need to remember the church, the church is not the same thing as the kingdom either. There's a lot of overlap, but the fact is we as human beings, we're not where we should be. We still struggle with sin. We don't see God's purposes completely fulfilled in us, at least not yet, but we, we still are. We still are people of the kingdom. The church is a community in which the reality of the kingdom, the reality of the rule of God, ought to be more and more real, more and more evident as we wait for our king to come again. And that means that as we live out our lives as citizens of the kingdom, then kinds of changes should be happening in us. And those changes need to go beyond just you know, growing spiritually, developing a deeper personal relationship with God, though those things are vital too. Those are necessary. But when people meet us, they should also then be able to see and experience something of the kingdom of God in the way we live our lives. As God's people, as his kingdom people, we need to always be asking ourselves, what, what does the coming of the kingdom look like? You think, for instance, what does the coming of the kingdom look like to a single pregnant mother who's, who's struggling to figure out, can she really make it if she decides to keep her child or not? What does the kingdom look like then? Or what does the coming of the kingdom look like to an indigenous family in a remote community that doesn't have adequate health care or housing or even good drinking water? What does the kingdom look like then? Or what does the kingdom look like to a generation of young people who, who are worried about the damage that's been done to the environment? Is it too late to undo it? I'm wondering what, what kind of future is ahead of us? What, what does the kingdom look like then? 
when Jesus preached, he made clear the kingdom is at hand. And so when we share the gospel, when we share that good news that Christ, in Christ, our God and King has acted to save us and, and everything else that he has made, that also means helping people experience the coming of that kingdom in, in small but still real, tangible ways. Do they see the kingdom at work? Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, our Father in heaven, in your word you make clear you are a king. You have a kingdom. Though it's not the kind of kingdom we would necessarily have expected. We ask, Lord, that you open our eyes again to see how your kingdom is at work in this world around us. Help us to see how it is at work in our own hearts and lives. As we try to live out our faith, as we, as we try to live out our lives as your people, may those around us see and experience what your kingdom really is, that it is real, that it is here, and that it makes all the difference in the world. And all God's people said, Amen. I invite you to stand.